is advertised in Boston, New York, and Buffalo. 500 brave Americans wailing for the go, singing, blow your winds in the morning and blow your winds, I hope. All the way you're running here and blow, boys, blow. They'll send you to New Bedford. Arr, matey, call me Ishmael. To some land sharks to board and pitch you out, singing, blow your winds in the morning. Hey gang, we are at the New Bedford Whaling Museum here in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Now, I was driving from Cape Cod and I was doing a story there. I mean, we've even got the seagulls. How good is this for whaling? This is the real thing, guys. This is New Bedford. So I'm heading from Cape Cod and I'm going to East Providence to do another story, right? And I'm driving down this highway and I'm like, New Bedford, New Bedford. That's like Moby Dick, right? So I'm like, oh man, this is the real deal. We got to check this out, digging into it. This is really what inspired Herman Melville. He lived here for a year and a half in New Bedford studying. And, and this was the hot spot, the Quakers, the all the whaling captains were here. And they were, this was a rich area. I mean, God, this just smells and breathes history wait till you see so we're going to go through the museum now i don't do museums that much right but we've got to go through this one because as i'm driving and i'm making it back to my hotel i'm like i've got to find the captain of the moby dick where is he well he's on nantucket and guess what we're going to go there but before we do let's take a walk through the museum here and let's i'll just take you along together Let's just do it. I've already paid for my ticket. And let's check it out. I have not seen any of it yet, but I met with Jennifer who runs the place and she gave me an overall kind of an idea where to go. Now look at that. It's hard for you to even imagine or picture, but that is an actual scale heart, I'm guessing, of a whale. I mean, it's it's unfathomable when you look at that. Wow. Well, I guess a lot of the cool stuff is upstairs, so let's go up there and check it out. So we're early, which is cool. I think we're like the only ones here. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Sorry, guys. Look at this thing. I don't even know. Is that like part of the jaw? Put in comments, anybody because I'm just kind of doing this on the fly and I haven't done a lot of study of any of the history. Here's a skeleton, holy caramba. Look at the size of these things. Are these sperm whales with the square head? Or is that another type of whale? Oh boy, these are the real bones. Look at that. That's the real deal. Wow, let's keep going. So she, we can't see everything in the museum, but I wanted to kind of do this virtually and live. Well, semi-live. So you could do it like you're actually, you know, this is not staged. So look at this, here's some more modern artifacts, I would say. Harpoon gun, right? Look at that interesting. Scenario builder compiles the who, what do you suppose that is? Of a planned naval exercise. I see arrows, harpoons, but this, scenario. maybe that's like a laser spotter. Two surface ships I'm guessing that's like a, a laser spotter. So this is more of the modern stuff. Whaling. Interesting. Look at that. But what I want to see I want to see the old stuff. I want to go back to Moby Dick days. And I think it's back here. Yeah. Let's go. Look at that. Look at some of this artwork. Wow. What a gallery this is. It says, upon seeing New Bedford, Gosnold's chronicler, Gabriel Archer, prophetically observed the two main rivers that may happily become good harbors and conduct us to hopes men so greedily thirst. Wow. Look at this.
this one, the Quakers, right? Yeah, the Quakers. Boy, you talk about going back in time. And this is an original. Look at that. Uh, the artists from the day, some of the masters were just, you know, they, they it almost makes them come alive. Isn't that beautiful? Like, look at the sheen, the reflection of the helmet. Breathtaking. Look at that young girl reading. Isn't that amazing? Hunting the whale. Oh my gosh, look at this, guys. Look at these harpoons. Are you kidding me? So this is probably more from the modern day. These are massive. Can you imagine having that plowed into your body? Those poor whales. Well, of course, they don't do that anymore. And thank God that's been outlawed. But there are some people still doing it, some countries. Now this will give you a feel for the latter day ships. And they're, look at that, they walk on this, this gangway here to the front. Can you imagine in the heavy, crazy seas and you're standing up on the bow with this massive harpoon gun with one of these things? Just in crazy, crazy. And then look at these barbs. Oh yeah, look at that. That's that's the barb that would come out after it enters the well. I mean, it's just such a huge scale. Here's another cool painting. Look at that. I love some of this artwork, I gotta tell you. It's an old trunk. Let's see if that says, it's a Jonah cast overboard. Oh, that's the painting here. So this is Jonah cast overboard. And the chest is the, called the Razo chest, 1894. Okay. By the way, there's a huge, there's a huge skeleton of a whale in here. Look at the fins, very interesting. Yeah, it almost looks like a paw. And of course, giving scale to the human figure. So this is a sperm whale. Yes, those are sperm whales. So it's interesting is the, it, the bone comes to a point. So that means that, oh, here's a great example of this, what this looks like in life. So yeah, it has that big square big square nose so that's got to be all cartilage and soft tissue I don't know it must be and it's all supported from below by this plate this wood plate look at those look at the jaw so of course they would use the teeth and some of the bone to do scrimshaw which are the fancy carvings um, let's see look at this old ship with a, a beautiful painting behind it Look at that painting, wow. Now I've got some reflection here, it's kind of hard to see. But it says Dutch Bay whaling in the Arctic. A Dutch Floyd ship, 1640 to 1660. Let's see what else we got here. This looks like Arctic, Arctic wear here. Oh, look at, here's one of the whaling boats. Look at that. Just like in the movie, Moby Dick. And what they would do is right here, 
here's the log head, the logger head. And they would pay the line out right here. And of course, they'd have to pour water on here constantly as the line was paying out. It, it was attached, of course, to the harpoon that was attached to the whale. And this thing would just be bouncing along, high flying. And the wood actually is designed on purpose. It's, it's only a quarter inch thick and you would think it would shatter, but it's, it's just basically buckling in and out. Flexible, it's designed to be flexible, so otherwise it would shatter. So imagine these men, and look at the size of these oars. I believe these oars, as I recall, are about 16 feet long. Massive oars. And they would easily, these sperm whales could go up to a mile deep. So sometimes they would, they would, you know, they had several bales of rope here and sometimes they'd have to get another boat and switch and attach the rope. The whale went straight down to the bottom or more than a mile deep. Now here is a great, this is really what I wanted to see is one of the old harpoons. And this is right out of the movie Moby Dick. Look at that. And look at the, the finish of the wood on there. So this is 1700s, 1800s, guys. In the 1800s, this place was absolutely booming. It was one of the richest cities in the country. And sperm whales were known to attack the boats, attack ships. So that, of course, that's what Moby Dick was based on. We're gonna talk about that. Let's see who is this is a portrait of Captain Franklin F. Smith, 1835. Coat is 1830. And that is a model of his bark Concordia. That's the ship that he sailed. Oh, can you imagine living in these times? Wow, how exciting. And we look up above and there's all the different harpoons. All right, well, let's look at one more thing and let's look at this marvelous ship here. Look at that. I think this is the largest scale model of one of these ships. And it is, I'm gonna say, it looks like it's to scale. Maybe a little smaller to scale, but these ships weren't that large. You know, you think of these ships being massive and they they weren't as large as you think. Let's take a look at this. Oh, this is marvelous. Look at the davits. A lot of attention paid to detail. There's the yard arms, full sail. Of course, in heavy gales, these sails would rip. They'd have to have the a lot of guys sewing these sails back together constantly in new canvas. Yeah, this is a little bit miniaturized because again, this would be the whale boat. And this is probably half size, I'm gonna say. I'm just gonna guess. Half size, but just uh, look at all the, the works. Well, it looks like we can we can get up and go in there. Let's take a let's take a quick gander. Look at the anchor. Oh, the bow sprit. Look at that. Yeah, the guys would walk out there. Can you imagine in the heavy waves? Everything, all the chains. Look at. Oh, there's some good artifacts here too. It looks like on the walls, pictures. Boy, you could, I could spend hours here. I'm gonna definitely come back and get some detail. Observation. So let's, uh, 
Let's go up there. Oh, you know what? Look at that. There is a figure of a woman and I was in England three years ago in London and I went to the Admiralty Museum or whatever museum it was where uh, Lord Nelson's artifacts are of his bloody socks and you know he was killed in battle and was that the Battle of Trafalgar? No I think he won that yeah they won that and that's where it happened but um, they have a whole assortment there of actual those figures and some of them are really haunting. So I don't know a lot about, I'm not a ship guy other than I used to draw pictures of these when I was young and I've done some paintings of these ships and the seas. Look at the barrel down there in the hold. This is really well done. Yeah, this, I'm gonna guess this is half size. I'm sure it's, it's written somewhere. Let's go back to the poop deck. <laughs> I know this isn't the poop deck, but the back of the ship. So look at this. I guess the wheel would turn with ropes. It would turn the rudder. Look at that. I didn't know that. I mean, how archaic, right? Very interesting. So there's shelter in the back on this particular ship, like if you're in those storms. But again, the sea would be washing over the decks and anything on the floor the, or the deck would be washed away or washed down. And then the sea would drain out these holes. Let's take a quick look at the front of the ship. Is this the windlass? This is where the anchor, they reel the anchor in up and down. And of course the ship's bell right there. Yeah, we can't ring it. <laughs> so just imagine you're standing here, looking out, holding on in heavy seas. Or you're perhaps out there on the bowsprit, going up and down. Not me, guys. I'm not big into the ocean. Look at the size of that hook. And it's not even really pointy. It doesn't need to be at that. And then we come over here, and this is where they would boil the blubber, I believe. Here's actually a picture showing you. Now remember, this is half scale. This is miniaturized. An amazing reproduction. Oh, and you know what this is? See this here? This is a, uh, the guys would stand on this. This would be lowered out. And with the boat buck, um, basically going up and down in the waves and in the, in the swells, and it would be bucking. These guys would stand there, no safety lines, and they would stand on, on this uh, plank I forget what it's called, and they would lean their belly on this bar, and they'd have long poles that would have these blades, and they'd be carving off the, you know, carving the, the whale up, literally. And down below would be sharks. And if you fell off, you were a dead man, because the sharks were all feeding in the water down here on all the little pieces. In fact, they were taking chunks of whale, and the longer that whale was in there, the more sharks would come, and there was many a man lost that fell overboard accidentally. Within seconds, they would be eaten alive. So there she is. Isn't that beautiful?
This is the brass binnacle from the Bark Josephine of New Bedford, circa 1887, and you can see inside it's housing the compass. Marvelous. Look at this. This is where they would scoop people. You would sit in there and then they would hoist you up. Presumably like to get from one ship to another, right? It's called the gaming chair. Here's a picture. I see there's some very intriguing portraits. Some of these old captains. This is Captain James Townsend. Out of the 1800s, many, many voyages out of New Bedford Harbor he would make all across the seas, the Atlantic, but from what I understand he died in Madagascar. Can you imagine? How many times did he go around Cape Horn to get to the Pacific? You have to wonder. Boy, he was a handsome devil. Maybe we can find his grave. There's a couple more we can look at. this guy? Who is this guy? This is Captain Nye, N-Y-E, made at least one whaling voyage to the North Atlantic in 1821, returning 550 barrels of whale oil from the waters around Cape Verde Islands. Interesting. This looks like a young man. This is Captain Kempton. What a great portrait, huh? Well, Captain Kempton made six voyages as a master from both New Bedford and Fairhaven between 1826 and 1835, sailing to Brazil Banks and the South Atlantic for sperm and right whales. He later invested in whaling voyages before purchasing a farm in the extreme south end of New Bedford around Clark's Point. Well, we'll have to see if we can find Captain Kempton. Imagine his life story. So interesting, so adventurous. All right, so there's one more stop we're going to make as we leave the Whaling Museum here in New Bedford, and that is going to be, um, she said that, Jennifer told me there's a place across the street that has, it's the place where they shot the movie Moby Dick, where they had the part where, you know at the beginning where it's the pulpit and Orson Welles is delivering that speech, the beard, and it's just haunting. So she says it's there, it's the, as it was. So let's go check it out. All right, gang, we are leaving the museum right now and I'm gonna take you to a very special, cool place right up yonder. Right up the road here. And speaking of road, look at the old cobblestone, the original, the original stuff. But as we walk up this hill, there's a tall gray building there. And that is called the Siemens Bethel. Now Bethel in Jewish means, in Hebrew, means home. So Siemens home. And this is the location where they did the beginning, the opening scene in Moby Dick, well, near the opening of Orson Welles on the pulpit. 
So let's go in and let's have a look. All right, gang, we are in the chapel right now and we have Kimberly Aubett, who is the operations manager here. And we have Fred Toomey, who is the big honcho. He's the president. And you talk about knowledge, you're gonna hear some really cool stuff. And without further ado, before we get into it, I do wanna show you the famous pulpit from Moby Dick, but spoiler alert, right? This, this is actually a replica. Well, it's, it, it wasn't original to the movie. Well, it wasn't original to the chapel. Um, when the chapel was built in 1832, this pulpit did not exist. After the release of the film Moby Dick in the 1950s, we had hundreds of people come down to try to look at the pulpit that they viewed in the movie, but the pulpit was not there. So we hired a famous boat builder and he erected the pulpit for us. Neat. And is this all original? Like, look at these pews. Now this is where the sailors would come and I understand you said uh, something about it being they were being taught to yes. write or read? Yep, they were taught literacy here. Absolutely. Okay. A lot of sailors did not know how to read and write. And when they would go on a typical whaling voyage, which was about 48 months, uh, they were signing away uh, on contracts that they didn't know what they were signing to. So right. after a 48 month voyage, they would come home with just a few dollars. Neat. Well, I think the key thing that I was most excited about that you were talking about were these cenotaphs. So right. let's maybe we, we if you if everybody if you look at the walls and there's an upstairs too, you're going to see these cenotaphs. Now these are original. They go back some one to 1835. Correct. And we're not going to unfortunately have time to read them all. But let's take a look at this wall over here, and maybe you can tell us. And and I'll just kind of move the camera. And if there's anything that you'd like to highlight. So uh, the cenotaphs are uh, unfortunately grave markers for men lost at sea. Uh, this cenotaph in particular uh, was here before Herman Melville himself came to visit New Bedford. Um, so we think uh, by history and logbooks that he gained inspiration for the story Moby Dick from this cenotaph itself. And that's marble. Yes. Look at that. Yep. It weighs about 325 pounds, I would say. How thick is that? Pretty thick. I'm going to say maybe three inches. Three inches. Yep. Wow. Right. And, and all of the cenotaphs are original to the building. Yes, sir. And Fred was saying that Lloyds of London came in here and attempted to appraise them but there's according to Lloyd's of London there is nothing to compare with uh, this is the only place that they know of worldwide that cenotaphs such as these exist so the only replacement value is the cost of replacing the marble so uh, they can't insure them because they're, they're priceless as they say they're priceless we're the only um, building that actually has cenotaphs like these. Look at that. In memory of the men of the Scalloper Navigator lost at sea November 30th. Of course, cenotaphs, these are the men and ships that did not return. Correct. And these were paid for or brought by the families? families. Correct. Families or owners of the ships. Correct. Right. Look at that. And I see over there, erected, blah, 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 Nathan Bassett. I mean, it just jumps out to me. I see at the bottom, a 19 year old. Correct. So there were a lot of uh, cabin boys and yep. youngsters well, on these most ships. Most of the whalers were between the ages of 15 and 25. Okay. Uh, when they went out on these voyages, less than 50% of the crew would return. Yep. So that's- Wow, less than 50%? Less than 50, right. That I did not know. Right. One of the ones that I find most inspirational, most moving to me, is about a 17 year old down here that lost his life uh, at, off the coast of Australia or Africa. Oh, here, at this when one he here? Written, when he was bitten by a shark. Oh, look at that. He was bathing. His death, well, let me read it. Directed by the officers and crew of the bark A.R. Tucker of New Bedford to the memory of Charles H. Petty of Westport, Massachusetts. It was December 
1863. And look at that off the coast of Africa. He, d he died nine hours after being bitten by a shark. So he was bathing near the ship. And of course, you know, you're in deep water or you're in harbor, yeah. probably in the harbor and you never yeah. know. He may have had a wound on him from all the hard work on the whaling right, ships. Right, And He might know, have been washing his wound in the correct. blood and the water, right? right? Right, That's all it took was just the smell of it. Right. Well, what's, yeah. what's striking to me also about it is that it was the officers and crew who who did this for him. You know, he must have really been a, a beloved mate on the on that ship. Right. Well, thank you so much, you guys, for welcome. taking the time out. Uh, really appreciate it for our gang. And you know what? We're going to go from here, and we're going to look for some graves of some of the men on Nantucket, nice. starting with Mr. Pollard. Wow. Nice. Well, have fun. Thank you. Thank you. And there, way, way out, the ocean. But here, right here, is the harbor of New Bedford. And it is as busy today as it was back in the 1800s, back in the 1700s, as the number one port. Imagine in the 1800s, imagine looking out from here and seeing those old two and three masted ships coming and going, docked. Be amazing. on Nantucket Island now, Nantucket, Massachusetts, and we are at Prospect Hill Cemetery, and we are here to follow the legend of Moby Dick to the man that inspired the author Herman Melville to write this epic story. And as we walk to the top of the hill here, we search for the captain's grave. Call me Ishmael is how it all started, as the story goes. He was, of course, the only survivor of the doomed ship Pequod. In the legendary movie we all remember, Ishmael, who was a young Richard Basehart, Captain Ahab, Gregory Peck, and Queequeg, the tall, intimidating native. And of course, Orson Welles played Father Mapple, who could forget that at the beginning and then we had Mr. Starbuck, and of course, Stubb, the second mate. And the third mate, the little Irishman, his name was Flask. A very interesting family plot up here, a very interesting gate. Let's head over. And I see now, speaking of Starbuck, this is the Starbuck family plot, or one of them, a big name here. Perhaps the name that inspired Herman Melville for the first mate, Starbuck, Mr. Starbuck. There it says 1865. Beautiful wrought iron works as we look at the, the stones. Well, this is the real story. Now, it was the ship Essex, and it was a man named Captain George Pollard Jr. who would guide her down around Cape Horn and into the ever vastness of the Pacific. The whaling industry in the 17th and 18th centuries was honed to hunt these whales, these sperm whales, and they were especially after the blubber, which contained this precious oil. But the oil in its concentrated form was actually in the head, in the head of these sperm whales. They would seek out this precious oil called spermaceti. 
A given whale could hold 500 gallons or more of this alone. It was in its head. It was believed that this fluid acted as a type of ballast, maybe a key part of the whale's sensing and maneuverability. Now the whaling ships and their crews, they routinely left on tours that could last up to three years, maybe even more. And they would span across several oceans. Some ships would come back with riches and others with nothing. It was all a matter of luck. And here we have a child, William Hadwin. What luck of bad befell him. Very interesting stone. Of course, the lamb and the angel. Well, let's talk about one captain who was known initially as a lucky captain. His name was George Pollard Jr. He was born here on Nantucket Island on July 18th, 1791. He was the son of a ship's captain, the senior. They were from a strict practicing Quaker family. His father was that captain of the ship called the Essex. It was originally launched in 1799 and Captain Pollard Sr. was a captain who along with many of the others here out of Nantucket hunted the legendary sperm whales. A mammoth sized whales with those notable square heads. The product was that oil we talked about, the blubber, the valuable spermaceti. Well, George Jr. grew up to be a captain just like his father, and in 1819, when he was 29 years old, he was appointed captain of that same ship. His father had captained for so many years, the Essex, and after 20 unblemished years of profitable whale hunting, she had gained a reputation as a lucky vessel. His father was one of those lucky captains. Ship owners and crews, they were very superstitious, as many still are today. Another gate with the harp and another amazing stone with the anchor, all in marble. The name, Roland Bolger Coffin. Might that be a relation to the boy? There's a boy we're going to talk about. Well, he was one of the youngest men to ever command a whaling ship, and some of the characters were young too. The 21-man crew included a 23-year-old sailor named Owen Chase. He was the first mate. And then there was Matthew Joy, second mate. He had on six other Nantucket men. And these included Pollard's 17-year-old cousin we talked about, Owen Coffin. And the care and protection of Owen had been entrusted by his aunt, Nancy Bunker Coffin, to Pollard. And to fill in the crew, others had been recruited from Cape Cod and Boston. These were inexperienced seamen and were known as greenhorns by the locals. But off they set sail. Now the first few days of this mission were promising. There were good winds, manageable seas, beautiful sunsets. But four days after leaving Nantucket, the ship was struck by a sudden storm and suffered a knockdown. It had been rolled almost 90 degrees onto her side. Two of the ship's whale boats were lost and another was damaged. Miscalculations on the part of Pollard and his officers, and in part, the inexperienced crew was responsible. Pollard declared the damage was so extensive they should return back to Nantucket, but Owen Chase and Matthew Joy persuaded him to go forward. Let's go to the Azores. There they had hoped to replace the whale boats. Now after a difficult passage around Cape Horn, the Essex did arrive in the Pacific, and on November 20th, very far out in the ocean from land, some 1,500 nautical miles out, they found themselves just west of the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador. And they were having success. 
Now in those days, the lookouts would be high in the crow's nest, and if sighting the spray off far in the distance, they would say, blows. And if the whales were big, larger spouts and big sprays, the man in the masthead, he would bellow it out for five seconds. He would call down, blows, aye. All was good. They were bringing in the whales. But then, on one of these days, disaster would strike. It would be described many years later by an aging first mate, Owen Chase, telling the story in his own words. Captain Pollard and Joy were hunting smaller whales near the ship. It was I who spotted a very big whale, 85 feet in length, I say, laying quietly in the distance, its head facing our ship. Then, after two or three spouts, the giant made straight for our ship, coming down for us with a great celebrity. He was moving out at about three knots. The whale smashed head-on into our ship with such an appalling and tremendous jar as nearly threw us all on our faces. The whale passed underneath the ship and began thrashing in the water. I could distinctly see him smite his jaws together as if distracted with the rage and fury. Then the whale disappeared. Our crew was addressing the hole in the ship and getting the pumps working when one man cried out, Here he is! He is making for us again! Aye, I spotted the whale, his head half out of the water, bearing down at great speed, this time at six knots, maybe more. And this time he hit the bow directly under the cat head. And then he disappeared for good. Oh, the water was rushing into the ship so fast, the only thing we could do was lower the boats and try to fill them. We tried to fill them with our instruments, our bread, our water, our supplies, before the Essex turned over on her side. Captain Pollard saw us in distress from the distance. He was out there hunting the whales, and he hastily returned to see the Essex in ruins. So, with no warning, the Essex was struck twice by this enormous sperm whale. And the seawater began pouring in at an alarming rate. The Essex began taking on more and more. Well, they could not keep the ship afloat. It was sinking, and when the captain arrived, there was no choice but to abandon ship. And getting those key instruments out and loaded into the lifeboats with provisions, they did grab Captain Pollard's and Owen Chase's sea chests. It was not long before the Essex then capsized. The crew chopped off the masts and outfitted the whaleboats with sails mounted on pieces of the Essex spars. The crew was divided into three whaleboats. Each whaleboat had 200 pounds of hardtack, 65 gallons of fresh water, and two Galapagos tortoises. One boat was commanded by Pollard, the next by Owen Chase, and the third by Matthew Joy, and they all set sail. Their best guess was that the provisions would last them for 60 days. Pollard, Chase, and Joy together first tried to decide which way to go. Their closest islands were the Marquesas Islands, about 1,200 miles west of their position, but in those days the natives were thought to be cannibals. Captain Pollard suggested sailing to the Society Islands, which were further away and thought to be safer, but Chase and Joy disagreed. They said, we should pick up the favorable winds and let's go to South America. And once again, Captain Pollard reluctantly gave in. A month had passed as the three boats floated helplessly in the middle of the ocean. They laid there at the beating of the rays of the equatorial sun. They shivered through the long, cold, starry nights. It was finally on December 20th, near starvation, that the three whaleboats reached a deserted island, and they landed on the boats and they explored it, but there was little there to sustain them. So after seven days, they exhausted the island's supply of food. It was decided to set sail again, but three of the crew decided to remain on the island. 
and it would be later they would be rescued by a trading vessel called the Surrey. Well, the tiny group sailed east towards South America. Captain Pollard and Owen Chase had noticed that Matthew Joy's health was declining more and more, so he was transferred to Pollard's boat, but shortly thereafter he died. One of the crew members named Obed Hendricks was given command of Matthew Joy's boat, and the three boats sailed on. But then one night a gale came upon them. Owen Chase's boat became separated from the other two, so on the two boats would go alone. They faced many challenges, including Pollard's boat being attacked by a killer whale. But now, it being two months later, on January 20th, a crew member named Lawson Thomas died. It was just as the two boats had come to the end of their provisions. And it was at this point that to survive, the men resorted to cannibalism. As the crew members died, their bodies were eaten in turn. As Owen would again recall, one such man being eaten. Aye, the crew. They separated his limbs from his body and cut all the flesh from his bones, after which we opened the body, we took out his heart, and then closed it again. We then sewed it up decently as we could and committed to the sea. We then roasted the man's organs on a flat stone and ate them. Well, finally, only four men were left on Pollard's boat. One of them, a teenage crewmate named Charles Ramsdell, proposed lots should be drawn to determine who should be killed so that the others might survive. Captain Pollard did not like the idea, but as before, he gave in. But who can blame him? Imagine if he didn't agree. He would have probably been killed as soon as he turned his back. Killed for food. So. Who would draw the first black spot? Sadly, it would be the poor boy, Captain Pollard's cousin, Owen Coffin. This was devastating. Pollard said he would kill anyone who approached the boy, but Owen Coffin was brave and he accepted his fate. He is quoted as saying, like it as well as any other. Next, there were lots to be drawn to determine who would kill Owen Coffin. Well, it was Ramsell who drew the black spot. And at the fateful time, Coffin bravely laid his head down on the gunwale and Ramsdell pulled the trigger. As Captain Pollard would later recall, he was soon dispatched and nothing of him was left. Well, it was some days later when the next man died, crewmate named Barzillai Ray. This would sustain the men, the little tiny band, just a little bit longer. And Pollard and Ramsdell sailed on. And they finally sighted a ship. It was February 23rd, 1820, 92 days alone in the sea. And it was the ship, the whaler, Dauphin. The good captain of the whaler took them to a port city on the coast of Chile, and amazingly it was there that they were reunited with the survivors of Chase's boat. By February 18th, after 89 days of sea, Owen Chase's boat down to three men, Owen, Benjamin Lawrence, and a young Thomas Nickerson, who was the cabin boy, spotted a sail in the distance. And after a frantic chase, they managed to catch the English merchant ship Indian, and they were rescued. Upon his return to Nantucket on August 5th aboard the whale ship Two Brothers, Pollard had to face the wrath of Nancy Bunker Coffin. She was incensed that Captain Pollard was alive as a consequence of her son's death. But later on, things settled down and Captain Pollard was given command of another ship, the whale ship Two Brothers. It was the same ship that had brought him home. But that voyage also ended in disaster when the ship ran into rocks off French frigate Shoals and it sank. 
Well, that swiftly ended George Pollard's whaling career. No one would make him a captain again. He was considered unlucky. Well, we arrive here at what we believe to be his grave. It is an unmarked grave. Looking on find a grave, it was noted as Old Section, Prospect Hill, number 268. So we must believe that it is here where George Pollard Jr. rests between this grouping of stones. Well, he would spend the rest of his life here on Nantucket as a watchman. And it is here on Nantucket where he died at the age of 78 on January 7th, 1870. And I must say, what a life he lived. Rest in peace, Captain George Pollard, Jr. Rest in peace. Of course, Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick, was inspired by this man and his story. And this is what he said of Captain George Pollard, Jr. To the Islanders, he was a nobody. To me, the most impressive man, though wholly unassuming, even humble, that I ever encountered. Rest in peace.